Welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with performance physiologist, Mark Kovacs. Thanks for tuning in to the Pacey Performance Podcast. So really excited this evening to get Mark Kovacs on the podcast. So welcome to the podcast, Mark. Hey, thanks, Rob. Really excited to be here with you. Great to have you, mate. So we've had a couple of guys on in the past um, chatting about tennis. And the route I went down with when I fired over the, the kind of discussion points was to go down that route. So just before we get into the, the tennis chat and hopefully maybe some little bits of crossover into other sports that you've worked with, do you just want to give us a little bit of background on, on you and anyone that doesn't know anything about you, just a bit of uh, maybe education and, and what you're currently doing? Sure. Yeah, no, definitely. I'll, I'll do a quick rundown of uh, sort of where I started. Like a lot of us started as an athlete. Tennis was the sport of choice for me. Uh, played at a pretty high international level, then came over to the US and uh, played at college here. Uh, won an NCAA title uh, and then really got into the field of strength and conditioning. Uh, worked outside of tennis for a number of years and then got into the research environment. I did my PhD in physiology uh, with a focus on detraining actually, looking at uh, how athletes recovered and what the uh, timelines were regarding that. And then really got an opportunity to work with the US Tennis Association, heading up their sports science and coaching education areas. Uh, I did that for a little over five years and it was a great experience working with all the top players in, in the country, both at the junior level as well as the professional level, uh, as well as overseeing a lot of the medical side as well. We oversaw 90 professional tournaments where we oversaw the medical care, athletic trainers, physical therapists, uh, dealt with WADA, was the WADA liaison uh, or USADA liaison in the US and then the tennis anti-doping aspect as well for the country. Uh, then after that, actually worked with Gatorade, was the director of the Gatorade Sports Science Institute, uh, as well as working in long-term research and innovation uh, with PepsiCo and doing a lot of great projects, uh, some in soccer leading up to the last World Cup, did a lot with the NFL uh, and did some technology projects as well. And then most recently, over the last couple of years, I've uh, been working uh, as a consultant with a lot of teams and leagues uh, and individual athletes and really crossing over between the fields of strength and conditioning, sport nutrition and technology and trying to tie those all together uh, in high performance team environments as well as with individual athletes. So that's sort of uh, a quick background of where I spend most of my time. Uh, I, I'm a coach first, researcher second is the best way to describe how I approach things, looking at things from a practical application standpoint as much as possible uh, and then finding ways to help athletes, coaches and teams sort of succeed. So I mean, we talked about this a little bit before about the uh, the Gatorade Sports Science Institute. Can you just tell us a little bit about what that project was about and a bit more how you were involved? Sure. So you know, if uh, people aren't familiar, you know, Gatorade has this uh, re research institute uh, focused on research and education uh, and application or sports science services, and it's predominantly with um, the Gatorade teams and Gatorade athletes. So a lot of the work we were doing was looking at ways we could help those individual athletes and those teams succeed in a lot of different areas related to sport nutrition and performance, and it crossed over. Uh, in a lot of different areas. It's a lot uh, different to the consumer side uh, of Gatorade, the company. You still have it? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, mate. I thought, I thought I'd lost you then. I thought my, uh, I'm still nervous about this new bit of kit. I think every time someone stops talking, they've disappeared and dropped off the face of the earth. That's cool. That's cool. We've still got you. Um, so just one of the questions that I had uh, was, what's the state of um, US tennis at the moment? Especially sure. on the men's side, is it is it in good shape? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good question. I mean, I've been involved uh, either full-time or as a consultant for over a decade now. 
And you know, when when I started, it was really in a struggling position. Uh, there was uh, very few players in the top hundred. Uh, the pipeline wasn't looking great. Uh, there was a big sort of restructure, uh, a real big focus on putting into more uh, advanced systems. Uh, doing better job of tracking and incorporating players, working better with coaches around the country as well. Uh, and fortunately, we've seen a really good increase over the last uh, three to five years on men's and women's side. Um, highest number of players in the top 200 uh, on both men and women uh, are US uh, but players. Uh, we've got a great pipeline of junior players who are now transitioning to the professional tour. Uh, there's a series of uh, players that are all inside the top 150 now that are uh, between 17 and 20 years old. And over the next year or so, you're going to see four or five of those really break out. Uh, a couple of the players have uh, achieved a top 100 ranking uh, in some of the fastest time in history. So there's really, really good uh, progression right now. Uh, the numbers are very strong. The U.S. is the strongest country in the world when it comes to volume of players, which is a great sign. Now the next step is to how do you get more players into the top 10 and winning Grand Slams, which is another metric that w we look at. So I know you've obviously done some, and you've mentioned just there about your, you work with tech companies. What's, what's tennis like as a sport? I mean, I, I'm coming from a uh, definitely a beginner viewpoint here when it comes to tennis what's what's tennis like adopting technology sure so uh, a lot of the tech work i do is outside of tennis um it's okay. in it's in different areas but the tennis tech side of things um is pretty interesting you've got some companies that have dabbled in it uh regarding you know racket sensors and looking at some different accelerometers and gyroscopes that they're using on the racket to pick up some different metrics about uh angle phase trying to estimate um spin spin rates on the balls uh racket head speed things like that which is very valuable from a number of reasons. Uh, where tennis does a, a pretty good job is really on the um, analytics side. They're starting to spend a lot of time. A few big technology companies are helping with that. SAP and IBM uh, are both working with the professional tours, uh, providing a lot of those charting services. So we're getting some pretty in-depth analytics information in individual matches and then also in, in pool data to look at major trends across uh, the different athletes and the different styles of play. And then from a scouting standpoint, this is really providing uh, the coaches uh, a lot of great information to help them with educating their players and setting game plans and uh, figuring out the best strategies, what are going to give them the best chance of success. So it's taken a while. Uh, baseball in the U.S. was sort of the sport that utilized you know, the statistics and the analytics a lot earlier than tennis but over the last three to four years the analytics piece of tennis has really risen and um, it is providing some very valuable feedback especially at the highest levels so some big players getting involved with SAP and things like that yeah definitely I mean you know they're, they're at the highest levels um, the most of the junior level um, training does not have that luxury there yeah. isn't that uh, accessibility but there are there are companies say like Dartfish which is a, a, a software company they were first known for their biomechanical 2d analysis software video capture video motion analysis uh, and they've still got that great software but they've also transitioned now into this uh, world of analytics and tagging and they were one of the most utilized software programs uh, at, the mo at the recent Olympic Games uh, and they do a lot in the tennis space and we, we work pretty closely with them on a number of different things from an analytics perspective and, and using their technology which can be used off any video um, match that was done. So can I carry on the, um, on the tennis theme. I don't, th I don't think we went through anything like this with a uh, previous guest that have discussed tennis, but just the, what are the basic demands of the game? Um, and then hopefully we can, we can jump off that and, and discuss a few other things. Sure. I mean, tennis at the competitive level is one of the toughest sports. Uh, it's not a sport that you're going to see someone uh, go off the charts in any of the you know, generic physical variables. 
You know, a tennis player is never going to beat an NFL wide receiver in the vertical jump, or they're not going to beat a track athlete in the 100 meter sprint, or they're not going to, you know, lift a 225 pound bench press 30 times. But what they do have the ability to do is be very strong at all those levels and not have really any major weaknesses. They need endurance, uh, they need speed and power, they need that one on one uh, emotional capability and mental fortitude and toughness to be able to you know basically beat down someone for three four or five hours sometimes face to face you've got no timeouts you've got no ability to really you know t- uh, take a breather so all those components together make it a very challenging sport physically as well as emotionally and mentally and the volume of training the tennis players go through is very very high sometimes it's too high Tennis has a history of excessive volume, sometimes unnecessarily, uh, but it, it is one of the things that makes the sport so challenging at the highest levels. So at the highest level, what have you seen the differences in how they, let, let's just take the men, well, men and women, how, how, they, how they are trained? What, what's your experience of how that's developed over the last 10 years in the pro game? Yeah, no, I think I think tennis was historically built off a pretty strong endurance base. A lot of slow, long distance work was a staple for many players back in you know the seventies, eighties, even the nineties. Uh, and the game has ad- adapted a little bit. It's got faster. Points have actually got a little bit shorter. Most people don't realize that that the actual length of points is less. It's a bit more explosive. Uh, we know the a- uh, average point length is less than four shots. Uh, so it's not uh, a lot of very, very long points. There are still some, and sometimes they happen at important points. So you have to train for those longer points. But the majority of training now is focused on you know five seconds or less of work. Uh, so really trying to be as explosive as possible during those periods, making sure that you're working on your multi-directional movement patterns uh, in specific patterns that are related to the tennis strokes. It's not just traditional linear or lateral movement. It's a lot of multi-directional movements that require uh, specific footwork patterns that are different to other sports. And with the work I do in the other sports, you have to change your hat a little bit. When you're doing a cutting motion in most ground-based sports, there's certain mechanics that we know we want to go through to optimize the movement, and that's going to get us the fastest you know, from A to B. In tennis, sometimes it's not about being fastest from A to B. It's about being fast enough so that you're still balanced with a step and a half away to make the next stroke. And that's where sometimes the uh, information is a little bit different compared to other sports. And I think coaching come uh, tennis comes under one of them sports for, from from my outside view that that the strength coach or the conditioning coach or fitness coach or whatever you want to term it there is quite a lot of crossover into what I would see as the technical coach and when you're talking about footwork and things like that in like a um, just because soccer is the biggest sport over here in foot in, in soccer or football that would that that would be seen as or from my point of view that would there'd be a lot of crossover with the to the technical guys is 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 that the case is that the case or am i just getting that you know th- what i'm saying is that there's a lot of on court stuff that um maybe i would see as a as a technical uh coach but the snc coach is really influential in in how that happens I yeah I, th- I i you know i i think what you're saying is really important and you know the technical coach the tennis coach uh, a lot of the time actually understands the footwork patterns and the movement patterns a lot better than a than a strength and conditioning yeah. coach coming from another sport especially uh it, it is a very technical uh sport tennis and there's certain movement patterns that allow you to get your body in the right position for the strokes because the movement and the stroke production occur simultaneously in a lot of these 
positions. So it's really challenging, and a lot of the work I do in the tennis world is working with strength coaches who come from soccer or football or basketball and really work with them on understanding some of those nuances because there are quite a bit of difference. Uh, and the challenge is, and it's, it's a warning to a lot of the strength coaches to be a little careful with the types of movement training you want to do with your tennis players if you've come from other sports because sometimes it doesn't necessarily cross over directly. Uh, for example, a lot of linear um, speed work is not that uh, not the best use of time uh, because there isn't that much straight ahead sprinting that goes on. Most of the movements are uh, somewhat rotational in nature where the hips are rotating as they're moving. So it's not the fastest way to get from A to B, but it allows the athlete sometimes to get their hips in the right position to be able to load their back leg effectively and transition their weight into the ball. Uh, so some of those movements aren't seen in a lot of other sports, uh, which is one aspect. The other piece of it is you're yeah, really working closely with your technical coaches to understand what they're trying to work on because game styles dictate movement patterns and everyone on the tennis court plays a little bit differently. Some look to take more time away, some look to shorten the court, some look to lengthen the court in a way. They, they want the, the rallies to be longer. And if you understand that as a sort of coach in, in the sport and you're trying to work on movement patterns, it allows you to really understand what you need to work on from a technical movement standpoint. And then from a strength and conditioning in the gym perspective, more of a strength training standpoint, then you need to really adjust your techniques to incorporate some of that so you get really full transfer. Like we all know the traditional strength, strength training exercises are going to develop good lower body strength, good upper body strength, good power production, but we still need that transferability and sometimes that transferability is lost and that's the frustrating thing for some players and also for some tennis coaches when they're working with strength coaches that sometimes come from other sports that implement a very similar training program on a tennis athlete without taking into account the demands and some of the differences. So how are you, how are you measuring that, that transfer, Mark, in the, in the things that you've been doing? Yeah, so it's a great question. A lot of the me measurables are, you know, movement in tennis specific patterns. So not necessarily a 20 meter sprint or a 40 yard dash or something like that. A lot of it has to do with what we call X drills or V drills or, you know, run around forehand drills where they're actually in those movement patterns that we need on court. And that really tells you if they're improving their performance in those. Uh, then we have some, you know, anaerobic uh, assessment tests that we also do that are a little bit longer, 15 second and 30 second tests, uh, looking at change of direction, focusing on, you know, different changing patterns that they can do in that time period. So, you know, Traditional field tests are still you know, very valuable. Uh, we do some lab work as well with different aspects, but the, some of the lab work is more traditional lab work um, from a, a standpoint of assessment, uh, whether we're looking at hormonal changes on a day-to-day -day variance um, you know, from cortisol levels uh, to you know, general blood work, do quite a bit from a blood perspective, looking at performance blood work as opposed to sort of medical blood work, looking at it on a monthly basis to see shifts and then adjusting diet and training routines based on that. Uh, then also incorporating some of the technology and looking at you know power output changes. Some of the velocity based training work is utilized on a daily basis and not so much I think like a lot of people use it to determine when to reduce volume, but in a lot of respects on, in a tennis standpoint, you actually have to train him through some of that. So you may reduce load, but we want to maintain, uh, you know, the velocity of movement as best we can because, you know, tennis is a fatigue-based sport. You have to perform well at the end of matches. That's when most matches are won or lost. Uh, and you need to be comfortable training in a somewhat fatigued environment. Challenge is, you know, the difference between being comfortable in a fatigued environment with going over the edge and resulting in, you know, injury or illness. And that's what we're, we're all trying to avoid. Mm -hmm. So in, in such a rotational sport like tennis, how are you... Um... How are you taking them aspects from the from the court and, and training them rotational aspects in the gym? 
Sure. So co- combination, uh, like you may see in some other rotational sports, uh, like baseball over here in the U.S. Is, is is another big one, especially with the pitchers. We do a lot of the similar types of movements. So uh, a lot of work that we'll do will be um, hip dissociation work, where single leg work, focusing on the the ability for the upper body and lower body to function independently, and then to be synced and uh, to work on you know rotational loading patterns as, as much as we can, especially in the positions that we need from a tennis perspective. Uh, so a lot of this will be power-based movements, you know, variations on rotational dumbbell snatches, band work in those planes of motion, uh, a lot of different medicine ball variations, low to high chops and different variation uh, of lift movements. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the stuff that most strength and conditioning coaches are familiar with, with a slightly different twist with foot position, uh, open stands, forehands and backhands as a stroke is very common and trying to make sure that the athlete is fully engaged and knows when and how to recruit those muscles effectively in those positions need to be trained in the gym. If we just hold to a traditional uh gym movements, say squats and deadlifts and and things of that nature alone, we're going to be limited in what we do once we get uh, on the tennis court. So still incorporate a lot of the traditional lifts, but we also add a lot of this rotational work to that uh, because we really need them strong in those positions because very rarely does a tennis player be totally stable in a perfect uh, anatomical position. A lot of the time they are in contraindicated positions so you know knees are over the toes in many of the lunging type movements that we see on a tennis court so we do again light loaded but we do a lot of you know, what may be considered contraindicated exercises for for non-athletes but we need to get strong in those positions we need to make sure the athletes can handle those positions they have the mobility and the stability in those ranges that we're looking for so that they can perform when they're needed to especially in a somewhat fatigued state so you a fan of of power work um been done unilaterally as, as well yeah, very much so. A big, big uh, proponent of power-based movements um, and across the board, not just Olympic lifts, um, medicine ball work, sandbag work, uh, d- different Im- implements that we can utilize that can work on n- not only your know, explosive power with release, but also explosive power with some eccentric stability as well. So trying to make sure that we don't only just want to work Work on the the explosiveness of the movement, but tennis players, you know, decelerate, especially the lower body on the movements, and then the upper body in the stroke aspect. They're doing a lot of uh, eccentric loading on the decelerators, uh, and we need to make sure that we train both aspects of that. And not enough people are focused on the uh, eccentric loads of the tennis athletes, and that's where, as we all know, we see a lot of the injuries occur because they're training explosively the entire time and they're not really spending enough time on the decelerators and we're seeing these major imbalances so just just touch on deceleration there um i think did we, i think we may have touched on it um with alistair uh, a couple of months ago but um when it comes to deceleration on the court do you just want to talk to us a little bit about how you how you coach that that deceleration specifically yeah, no, most definitely. And a lot of it has to do with, you know, where is the hip and where is the ankle at load? If we have ankle instability, which you know, tennis is a sport like basketball uh, that has, you know, a history of ankle sprains just because of how many changes of directions you have and how many landing loads you have. So one of the big things is we spend a lot of time on ankle stability, ankle work, uh, even if there's no pain even if there's no ankle injury daily work on ankle stability is huge because we want them to feel very comfortable loading in those positions Uh, then also a lot of hip stability work um, variations on all the different glute medius uh, activation exercises on a daily basis single leg work predominantly Uh, then we take it into uh, our more of a plyometric progression where we'll actually load up uh, and do multi-hop 
movements, land and uh, release movements, really trying very, very hard to get them in the positions that we want them in on court, which is on a lateral position a lot where they're, they're shifting weight, they're working on their cutting positions and really trying to load the glute, load the hamstring a lot more than shifting into the quad, which especially on the female side, we see a lot of the female athletes really struggle with being able to load up their posterior chain as well as they should, especially in a lateral direction, which is where most of the change of directions occur, is being able to get in and out of the corners very quickly and then being able to transition that weight and really the, the best movers do that significantly better than the poorer movers and that really shows up on a tennis court. So what, what specifically are you doing more of with the girls um, to stop that? Yeah, so you, you, just like in a lot of the ACL prevention programs where, you know, a lot of them, they're called jump programs, but they're really landing programs. They're designed to improve your landing mechanics, shifting your weight back, not allowing that valgus knee movement or the Trendelenburg effect when you see in a single leg squat movement and really trying hard to make sure that we get those glutes working the way they should. We get those hamstrings developed with, you know, traditional hamstring exercises as well as some eccentric loading on the hamstring to build up that entire uh, backside of the body uh, and shifting our uh, pressure point. So our, our center of pressure in females we know is shifted forward in most cases. We want to work on developing that muscle mass and increasing uh, that posterior chain mass so that we can shift that weight back and then also make it really functional as well. Just developing mass is not the objective. The objective is to develop you know muscle that can then be utilized to improve ground reaction forces and help that athlete you know really transition from left to right from forward to back and you know working on the on those change of direction positions mm -hmm. so when it comes to specific uh ankle stability work that you, you mentioned the importance of what what does that look like yeah so every day it's a combination of pretty static movements that you would think of you know barefoot work single leg balance work shifting uh different positions of quarter squats half squats and below trying to work on you know not only the hip aspect of it but making sure that the ankle doesn't sway too much a lot of the time we'll use some form of center of pressure um mat to try to help uh, educate the athletes about where the pressure is going. Are they pronating? Are they supinating more? Are they shifting their weight back or forward as they go deeper? So really working from a biofeedback standpoint there, which is really, really beneficial. Uh, and then also doing a lot of traditional ankle strengthening work with bands and with tubing, you know, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion exercises, eversion, inversion, strengthening work, um, you know, very, very traditional sort of you know physical therapy type exercises after an ankle sprain, but doing that at higher and higher loads so that the athlete's ankle is really, really stable during those positions. And then also some flexibility work through up through the calf area because you know dorsiflexion range of motion is pretty limited in most tennis players, very, very tight. So every day there's something related to increasing dorsiflexion range of motion and really, really important for you know all aspects of movement but you know especially in tennis players because they do have a tendency based on how they're waiting most of the time on the tennis court they do have a, a pretty f a tight uh, dorsiflexion range of motion so how much does does physical therapy uh play a part in in the things that you just mentioned that are systematic of tennis players yeah so i mean over here there's a lot of crossover uh, and you know the best strength coaches have a very strong knowledge of traditional physical therapy exercises and progressions uh vice versa as well really good physical therapists have great manual therapy skills uh, but also understand the training components and the demands so you know i've been fortunate to be able to work with some of the best uh, and you know it's it's phenomenal to talk shop with with great physical therapists that look at the body, uh, 
a lot of the time from a very different perspective, sometimes much more conservatively than a strength coach would. Strength coach's first mindset is performance enhancement usually. Okay, how do I make them faster, stronger, jump higher? Physical therapist is always looking at, you know, where are sort of the break points or the weak points and how do we strengthen those and how do we reduce any limitations that we have? So, you know, the ideal scenario is is merging those two skill sets and those two fields together. Um, both have their place because they are a different world typically you know a great physical therapist has phenomenal manual therapy skills can relieve tension can you know do things that a strength coach has never been trained to do a strength coach can do things in the weight room uh, can do things with movement mechanics that most physical therapists can't do and in working those two skill sets together gives the athletes uh, the best chance of really optimizing their performance as well as reducing the likelihood of injury, which is really the best way to work these days. Just going to take a very quick break in the chat with Mark. In part two, you can look forward to Mark talking about uh, how he deals with the busy, busy schedule of pro tennis players and even junior tennis players and how he manages recovery uh, and also practice and SNC time as well. He also discusses what he's learned in tennis and been able to apply to other sports as well uh, and vice versa. So just before we get into part two, just want to say a massive thanks again to Val Performance, makers of the Nordboard for sponsoring this episode today and definitely couldn't uh, do it without them guys supporting the podcast um, and have been doing so for almost a year now so definitely check them out at valperformance.com so part two coming up with mark hope you enjoy I'll speak to you soon so with all that said about the um the kind of strength and power side of tennis players. The w- one thing that always amazes me is obviously Wimbledon because we have it um, and it's kind of all over the TV. They're coming from Queen's Club, which will be a week. And then obviously Wimbledon will start the following week. And then you hear them on Sky that they're in another competition, in another tournament in Belgium. When do these guys actually get time and energy to, to do this on the on the, on the the tour? Yeah, it's a great question. Tennis is a year-round sport. Uh, Off-season is non-existent, even though there's maybe four to six weeks max that's called off-season in December time period, end of November, December. Most of the better players have other commitments, um, media commitments, um, some high-priced exhibition matches that they play. Uh, They do some training during that period, but even then, uh, it's, it's very limited. So the training happens throughout the year and a lot of players are playing anywhere uh, over around 180 to 120 singles matches a year. Uh, many of them play doubles on top of that. So some of them are pushing 150 to 170 total matches per year. That's not including their training sets, their training time, which is usually double or triple uh, the amount of total hours of training compared to competition. So, you know, there's a lot of volume on these bodies. And like you said, they're week in, week out athletes. They travel, uh, cr- you know, cross continent a lot. So they're on planes. We know how challenging. Um, airline travel is for athletes uh, from not only a jet lag standpoint but also a physical um, sedentary perspective of sitting for so many hours and then having to come off the plane and be ready to perform within 24 to 48 hours Uh, so there's a lot of factors there that are just part of the sport Uh, there's certain things you do we do a lot on travel science. We do a lot on sleep science to prepare these athletes uh, at the best we can based on the best available science that we know currently. Uh, so there's a lot of things that are done to help them that standpoint. From a strength and power perspective, you sort of, you know, over the years develop more of an undulating, nonlinear, periodized model where we're working on each variable each week. So we have our certain days which are more power focused, certain days which are more strength focused. Uh, 
but we're also having some hypertrophy for some of the athletes focused. We're doing a little bit of a muscular endurance, not that much because of the, the time commitments and the loading that the athlete already has. Uh, so we're really trying to optimize the athlete's development based on their needs. Um, again, body composition in tennis is, is a big component as well. Excessive body fat is a real limiting factor uh, because of how much volume that goes through the, the athlete and how much they have to perform. So you know, be cognizant of that during your uh, competition and training weeks with, with not only the nutrition piece, but also the type of training is really valuable. And the best folks really you know take care of all those little details. Uh, and it does m- m- make a really big difference, especially with these athletes that sometimes play 30 to 35 weeks of the year. So they, they're competing that many weeks of the year and then those other weeks are training weeks it's very rare for a tennis athlete to have more than two weeks off any time throughout the year when we say off i mean not playing tennis that typically doesn't happen uh with the work i do in other sports where we have a dedicated off season six weeks eight weeks sometimes 10 weeks of not even looking at the sport that they're involved with then they have a pretty long extended preseason to get themselves back in shape and then they go into sort of a you know early part of the season where they're still not optimized physically but they're good enough and then they're really trying to peak for whatever the competitions are so you know a I always enjoy working in some of these other sports that have their schedules mapped out a year in advance. You know exactly you're playing every game on a Saturday or you're playing a game on a Wednesday and a Sunday and you know your schedule a year out. You can plan your workouts. You can plan your recovery days. You can plan everything. In tennis, every week is different. If you win, you keep playing. If you lose, you go home. Uh, So your weekly planning is more daily planning. And, you know, for a lot of coaches and and individuals that have never worked in the sport, that's probably the hardest part for someone that's come from a very structured, typically team-based environment to go and work with an individual sport like tennis that doesn't have a set schedule. Uh, It all has to do with how much your player's winning or losing. Uh, That's usually the, the biggest challenge for most strength and conditioning coaches that come into the sport. So I'm guessing with with such little time with these guys or sustained time with these guys, it's got to be a case of cutting to the chase and and figuring out what's really important to make the most of the time that you have with them. But but what else have you learned from from tennis um, taken into the other sports that you work with? Yeah, I think your point about don't waste time, don't do things without a direct purpose. Um, Every moment is accounted for. We're not, we're not spending 45 minutes on warm-up unless that warm-up is also muscle activation, is also core strength, is also stability work, is also ankle and hip, you know, making sure that if we're called, we're not really, you know, I don't really call anything warm-up. It's a term I don't really like. It's more when doing something, whether it's muscle activation, whether it's, you know, stability work, whether it's, you know, functional flexibility, whatever it is, you got to make sure those time periods are optimized because, you know, a lot of the time that's a big part of the training session. Then they go into, you know, whatever you're doing in the gym and you have to be, you know, challenged with that because, you know, you're doing gym sessions, day off matches, day before matches, uh, and you have to, you know, be smart about what you're doing. We, we don't have the luxury of having athletes walking around with DOMS for two or three days and just, you know, working through that. Um, that's, that's not a smart way to approach the day or two before matches. But if you're playing 30, 35 weeks of the year, you don't get too many periods where you can do a traditional block periodized model where we're, we're going to go four weeks really, really hard and heavy in the weight room and expect yourself to be pretty sore. Uh, so, you know, we don't really have that luxury. Uh, the best players, because of their ability to schedule, they don't have to play all the tournaments. They pick and choose their schedule better. 
they do usually, and what we try to do with our best players is have, you know, four training blocks throughout the year, usually a three-week period, uh, four times a year where we can really commit to an area of focus. It could be a strength issue. It could be a flexibility focus. It could be, you know, a, a, a movement deficiency that we're trying to correct, and that allows us some dedicated time to work on that. So how far, how far down the world ranking would you say that, that applies? where they, they're the guys and girls can, can really pick and choose and be really selective in, in what they do and when? Yeah, that's a great question. Honestly, it's about uh, top 40 in the world. Um, so okay. it's, only about, it's only about 40 players that really are making enough money that uh, know sort of that they'll do well each week to be able to do that you, you know top 36 players get seated in the grand slams and that's sort of a cut point so you sort of want to be in that top 36 in the world uh and it's not easy to stay there um you don't you know tennis is one of those sports where you have a few bad weeks your ranking drops pretty quickly so you don't have the luxury of you know, not performing well for months at a time. You need to be pretty much on year round as best you can. You may not you win tournaments, but you want to win matches and, and win enough matches to progress. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, I'm, I'm just conscious of time, mate. Um, just just before we let you go, where can people keep up to date with with what you've got going on? Um, and yeah, the, sure, yeah. Yeah, no, no, I do a few different things. Uh, if you're on Twitter, um, connect with me at mkovacsphd, uh, mkovacsphd on Twitter. Uh, you can check out my personal website. Uh, it's mark-kovacs.com. Uh, also, we have an institute here in Atlanta where uh, we work with some select uh, elite individuals. It's called Kovacs Institute. Uh, so kovacsinstitute.com. Uh, and then also do a lot um, with a university in town called Life University uh, and you can visit their website at lssi.life.edu. Uh, we host a, a number of conferences a year on campus. We've got a baseball one coming up on November 19th and 20th. We have 10 major league teams represented, uh, strength coaches, athletic trainers, physical therapists and chiropractors uh, are the focus. And then next year we're hosting the National Coaching Conference, which is a, uh, a combination of the U.S. US Olympic Committee, the NCAA, uh, the National Federation of High School Sports, uh, also Shape America, and uh, it's a group that gets together with the best coaching educators in the country, and the theme next year is coaching education and technology, so if that's of interest to folks, take a look at that website. So again, Rob, thanks again for having me uh, on the podcast. You, you do an outstanding job, and I uh, look forward to connecting with folks who are interested in some of this information. Absolutely. Well, thanks a lot for all the um, all the info and, and thanks for your time, mate. What was the just regarding the the conference that you mentioned right at the end? What's the website again that people can have a look on? So for that conference, it's called coachingconference.life.edu. So coachingconference.life.edu. Cool. Well, I'll leave it there, mate. And uh, just thanks again for your time and thanks a lot for the kind words. And I'll I'll. Um, I'll make sure the five five dollars or five pounds in the post. No, I appreciate it. Really do mean it. Keep making an impact, you know, helping to educate, you know, thousands of people. Thanks, mate. Speak soon. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to episode 106 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. So just before I let you go, just want to ask a very, very small favour. Uh, if you are enjoying the podcasts and have been enjoying them for the last three years nearly. If you'd be so kind to leave a rating and review on iTunes, if iTunes is your preferred um, system of choice to listen to the podcast. So jump over to iTunes and obviously under uh, write a review, just leave an honest rating and review and that'd be really, really appreciated. Just it gives exposure to the podcast uh, and allows it to be, um, to be listened by more people, which is great. So thanks again for your support. Uh, hopefully some really good guests coming up uh, over the next couple of weeks and I will speak to you soon.